Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I'd like to tell you that we have a very distinguished group of panelists and we are going to talk on a particular topic which is very important in this field. Now, the important thing is what we're going to look at is basically a practical aspect of handling things. Now, we've already had two uh, sessions just now which looked at both AMH as well as uh, AFC. Now, we're going to look at it in a little different way and basically we'll also see a personal experience of these people and how they actually handle it. And that is the most important thing because they will be telling us how things to be done and what is the correct way and what is the way in which they have done and their experience. And that is a very important thing. So I'd like to uh, say that we have a good panelist group and they will actually give us a very good idea as to how things need to be done. Now, to ask you first, uh, basically when you say oocyte numbers, you say in mid mid gestation, it's around six to seven million. At birth, it's around one to two million. At puberty, it's around 300,000 to 500,000. But when it goes up, it comes down to around 1,000. Ideally, it should have been the opposite way around. Then all of us would have been having a much better way of handling things. But unfortunately, it's not like that. Now, when you look at it, can I ask all of you, what exactly do you mean by diminished ovarian reserve? Um, no strict criterion for what is considered to be diminished. I, I suppose it may be taken to mean that if it is diminished, it is not adequate for usual uh, means for, for what we usually wish to do with whatever the ovarian reserve is intended for. Would like to, anybody else? Would like to I talk? would only add to this that we are looking at the reserve, not the response. And hence, at a given age, we expect a certain reserve to be there. And if it is lower than that, reserve is what we test by our test. Response can only be seen after we stimulate the ovaries and then see whether the response is according to the reserve or not. So reserve, I think it is, it is um, diminished ovarian reserve is for any given age. If we feel that the AMH values, AFC value, ovarian volume, everything is lower than what we had expected is what is diminished ovarian reserve in my opinion. Any other comments you'd like to say? Um, I would like to add that there's no consensus on a definition of diminished ovarian reserve. Or for that matter, even ovarian reserve. Um, can anyone say what is a normal ovarian reserve at age 30? Um, I do not think there is any consensus on that exact definition. Um, because there are so many influential factors that will affect that reserve. Um, and as we move on, I'm sure there'll be more of these uh, discussions. And so how would you define diminished ovarian reserve? Although you say that diminished ovarian reserve doesn't mean anything, uh, would you have any particular definition for diminished ovarian reserve? There's so many definitions. There are so many uh, names given to this also. So I think it is Bologna who was the first one who came up defining poor ovarian reserve, though there, there are a lot of questions over Bologna and the Poseidian group has now come up that we have to differentiate low ovarian reserve from low ovarian response. And that is how we would define Bologna. Everybody knows it is the age of the woman, the response of the woman, and a number of oocytes, and besides that, AMH, AFC, AFC less than uh, 5, and AMH less than, is it 0.7, I think? 0.7. Yeah, 0.7, 0 .7 nanograms 7. per ml. So that is what Bologna says, but then this is one body, the Americans and the Europeans got together and formed the Bologna criteria. We are yet looking at more criteria to come up in future. Any comments? On the definition, would like to say? Anything other, than the, anything other than the Bologna criteria which you think needs to be added on? And I, I'm also sure that it actually may be confusing if one thinks of response, you know, uh, and compare with reserve, you know. <laughs> yeah, the response and reserve could be uh, maybe different. So how you will are going to respond may be different okay. from you. Would you attach diminished ovarian reserve with any of these things? Like a premature ovarian failure or menopause or would you, would you call it the same or would you say it's totally different? Premature ovarian failure would be different from a diminished reserve. So it, it is different. Yeah, actually. it would be different. Anybody else comments? 
They lie differ in this, and I feel a diminished ovarian reserve signifies that possibly all the testing of the ovary shows that the reserve is very low and is indicating premature ovarian failure only. We are not talking about response. I always try to segregate a response from what the tests tell us. Sometimes we get almost a normal uh, looking ovarian reserve and yet when you stimulate, they are truly like poor reserve people would have stimulated and made oocytes. And that is why the newer classification, there was need to come up with the procedure where group one and group two were less than 35, more than 35 and a good reserve. Good reserve means 1.2 nanograms of AMH and more than five, I think, AFC. Would anybody like to comment from here? A failure is perhaps failure or poor reserve will, will ultimately, ultimately lead to failure, I, I think. Okay. Now, when you, uh, you've already commented on the Bologna criteria. Anybody else would like to add on to what the criteria is? Basically, this is the criteria. Now, anything that you feel is, is this, do you think that this is the best uh, definition or is it anything else that you would like to add on to this? To, to say that they've got diminished ovarian reserve. Now because Bologna criteria people feel is not adequately, yes. is not the right thing. Right, so right. what else would you like to add on? I, I was just going to say, now this may be the best thing up to the moment, but people are still unhappy. They're unhappy? Yes, yes. So why are you unhappy? I'll tell you why. Because out of these three, you need to meet two criteria. Now suppose advanced stage is 40, this is a woman of 38. You've got less than three oocytes, but the AFC is high and the AMH is more than 1.1 nanogram. Doesn't fit into the poor ovarian reserve. They say two criteria. out of three, yes. no? generally. So that is why they had to segregate response from reserve and bring up something more than this because Bologna was not sufficing to um, sort of describe every woman who came out with a poor response because she did not fit in. I mean, she would not have two criteria out of the three if she was younger yeah. and the reserve tests were better. Yeah, the other thing they also say is that if everything is normal and you've done two cycles of IVF and each time you've got only two or three eggs, then definitely you'll call it a diminished ovarian reserve, although everything else was shown as normal. So those are things which are uh, pr the, from a practical aspect to look at whether it's actually causing a problem or not. Now, can I ask you why and when would you check ovarian reserve? Do you do it as a routine basis or for yeah. everybody who comes to you, do you do it? or do you do it only for a particular situation or in a, from a practical point of view, how, what do you actually do you do? In a practical situation, if we are going to do any kind of assisted uh, reproductive technology, any technique, you would definitely test the ovarian reserve. So you see. test for everybody who comes to you? Yeah, I would any test comments? for anybody. Yeah. If well, I, I, I do differ on that. Um, I have to mention at the outset that I work in the UK, which is a national health care service. Um, it is a service which is free of charge and it has some difference to the way you work here um, because some of these tests could be used to rash, ration the practice so not everyone can be eligible for IVF in the NHS and therefore some of these tests are actually used to ration that. Um, but bearing in mind why check ovarian reserve, the American College, um, the ACOG guidelines clearly state that you should not be measuring for ovarian reserve routinely um, before the age of 35. And we know that none of these tests have a very good uh, predictive value for a pregnancy. We are talking about a live birth or a take-home baby rate. Um, we can predict the response um, to some degree, but not to the final outcome. Um, hence, to, in my uh, opinion, age is probably the best test of ovarian reserve. Abba, Henry. Well, uh, 35, I agree with Dr. Bhattacharya. Uh, all books say that... I'm so sorry. After 35, it is a must, but in Indian scenario, I like to do it after 32 because our ovarian reserve appears to be slightly less than what. W would it is. you do it for everybody who's. Everyone who over comes 32, I'll just tell you, everyone over 32, everyone who's had an ovarian pathology or a surgery, anyone who's had a, 
uh, long term history of infection like hepatitis B carriers or HIV carriers, anyone who's had chemotherapy and younger women who come with unexplained infertility. All young women who have unexplained infertility, I want to look into their ovarian reserve because a lot of younger women at 25, 26 suddenly decline their ovarian reserve and possibly that is the reason why they take more time to pregnancy and hence come into the group of infertility and come and present to us. Any comments? Um, now, I personally, I would do FSH basically as an indicate, sort of an indicator of, of the, her ovarian status and perhaps I would use that in calculating the FSH dose that I may be giving her. Personally, I, I don't do AMH. I agree with our previous speaker that uh, I think um, we're getting a bit disillusioned. I, I, I hardly do one AMH a year because I personally, people may think that I'm good, a bit crazy. I mean, no matter how low is the AMH you're able to get eggs from her. Huh? And I think all women deserve a chance. And, and, and then when I, when once in private practice, you, you will tend to, to, to help those patients if they can afford. And, and, I, and one may actually be quite surprised to see that stimulation, consecutive cycles of stimulation will improve the, 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 the cohort and the quality and quantity of, of the old sites. They, they will keep improving. I mean, if you would just look at the study of DHEA way back in 2006. <clears throat> I mean, that was a typical example of consecu consecutive cycle stimulation that uh, it went from one follicle to three, four, five, six to so over 10. And, and that was just over consecutive cycles. But that was a phenomenon not recognized by the author or okay. by the authors. They, they thought it was due to DHEA, and they asked the patient, and the patient said, oh, you know, I, I've been taking uh, uh, DHEA. And then they went back and, and thought, oh, from the fourth cycle on, in fact, the, the number of oocytes increased. And, and, and then everyone thought DHEA ought to be taken for three months or four months before they start to work, but it would actually be consecutive cycle of stimulation. And, and then by the fourth, I mean, each batch of eggs would take Four months to come yeah. out, and by the time you stimulate that, that uh, the ovaries for up, up to about by four months, that batch of eggs you would have been stimulating almost. I mean, it, it would be a field effect. You see, <clears throat> when follicles develop, they would they organize the vascular vascular vasculature that would bring blood and nutrients, and therefore all those that are developing and yet not seen would be benefited. And, and they will be less atresia in the number as well. So quantity and quality would improve. Better. Okay. So, so, so basically, for me, I stimulate yeah, everyone sorry. and keep going. And, and everyone would get uh, better and better eggs. So, so reserve tests don't mean much to me. So one thing for checking over in reserve is basically to see whether they're, it's poor or it's excessive or whether it's normal. That's one thing they do it. But it's usually not done as a standard for everybody. But uh, one question I wanted to ask, before you do IVF, do you do that on a routine basis? Would you like to comment? Ye yes, before You said I you'll do it for everybody. No, I, if, even if you don't do the biochemical test, antral follicle count is something which you would definitely check for some, everyone. And any comment on, before doing IVF, would you do this? Before doing and IVF. do you think it's got an importance? Um, FSH is routinely done um, in our practice. Um, however, personally, I don't believe that that has any um, predictive value because of the low um, sensitivity it has in um, predicting ovarian reserve. Um, antral follicle count, I believe in that because you are going to do a scan to rule out other uh, pathologies within the uterus, endometrium, and in that process, it is a valuable test you could perform at that time. Can I ask you? For a person with a polycystic ovary pattern on doing a Sorry, scan, I know what you want on a to scan, ask. Would, you, would you do other tests or not? Yes, I will do. Before IVF, I would definitely do antral follicle count and an AMH, and especially in a PCO girl. Because if AMH is really high, then we can predict hyper response. And these are the ones where we need to stimulate very carefully. Our starting dose has to be low, nothing else. Because AFC in a studded ovary, which has more than 40, 50 AFC, 
will not be able to give you that much of idea as much as AMH and I have seen AMH as high as 100 picomoles and we really start with low doses of FSH here maybe 7500 units just to prevent a hyper response. So basically from a practical point of view you feel that especially before More IVF important it is to important to predict a hyper response rather than a hypo response. Okay and uh, how do you measure ovarian reserve? Like uh, how and when would you measure the ovarian reserve? Then I just put it there. Uh, any comments on what I've written there? Okay. Uh, For counselling, is it important? I think it is very important at counselling when they come and especially when we are going in for a procedure like IVF which is so costly, which is so unpredictable, where we cannot really give them a real, uh, you know, uh, a real prediction of their success. I think it's very important to tell them that we need to look at your ovarian reserve, we need to look at your age and we need to see what pathology you are suffering from because that also has an impact on the egg quality, maybe endometriosis yeah, will have an impact. Especially like negative. you said, unexplained. Yes. And sometimes that is of benefit at certain points. Yes. Any other comment you would um, like to say on I your think, counseling? I um, think counseling has a very important role in um, why we measure ovarian reserve because you really want to set your patient's expectations um, and that is when the outcomes, even when they are poor, are more acceptable to the patients. And hence, I think fertility in counseling is one of the most important outcomes of measuring ovarian and reserve. And you feel that ovarian reserve, testing, testing for ovarian is reserve very important is, is, in is that helpful case. in counseling. Yeah. It's very important. You have to do ovarian reserve testing before you, we go in for IVF because counseling is done very easily on the basis of their test and we always make a mental makeup for the patient that you're going to be a poor responder, you're going to be a hyper responder, so be prepared, we'll freeze all your embryos and we may not transfer in this cycle if you truly, truly hyper respond. It helps you to plan how you're going to go about it. If you know exactly, then so many things you can decipher from that. Okay, we already mentioned about age, more than 35, you said you'll do it at that point. Then. Uh, this, if there's a family history of early menopause, something, that's something also maybe you'll look at. Now, does this have any importance? And is this something which you look at when you'd uh, you like to comment on it? Uh, only, only in premature, premature ovarian we insufficiency, yeah. I would want to premature do a karyotype to find out whether it is Turner's or it is a mosaic of Turner's. FMRI1 fragile X, I'm sure uh, Dr. Mukhopadhi, I will tell you more in Britain, it is done very rampantly. We do it less often. Um, uh, uh, yes, it is important. The fragile X premutation changes um, and particularly carriers. Um, I think the role uh, remains pretty much in patients with recurrent pregnancy failures. Um, still, it is not with really the poor responders. Then, uh as I said, you've also mentioned about people who have had treatment earlier, that's fine. Now, I just wanted to ask you something. Do you think obesity has anything to do with it? And uh, would you like to just comment on something like uh, ovarian drilling and tubal ligation? What do you think? Does it have any effect on ovarian reserve? Yeah, the way you've done the drilling, sometimes you the rampantly you just go and uh, any amount of punctures you want to make and you've done it. and it's definitely going to compromise the ovarian reserve very badly. So how you've done it, ligation also, your blood supply gets compromised to the ovary and ligation definitely has so a… So even if you're doing a, for a hydrosalpinx, uh, do you feel that that will actually affect the ovarian reserve? Yes, I, I, I do think so because if you do a subinjectomy, that will certainly compromise <coughs> the vasculature. Therefore, I would probably just do a proximal clip and, and that's minimum disturbance, that will lead to minimum disturbance. So if there's a hydrosalpings, would you remove the hydrosalpings or would you just I clip would just it do and a keep clip. other… I would only clip it. Clip it. And that's basically because you, that vascularity will be affected and… Unless it's a pyosalpings. Unless it's a pyosalpings. Uh, just, I just want sure. to add um, uterine artery embolization. I don't know how much is done in this country for fibroids. It is becoming very common in the UK and I think that is one of the other factors that could lead to reduced ovarian reserve. We still have insufficient evidence in that area. Okay. Uh, do you think this has an effect on uh, the ovarian reserve? Polymorphic? Yes, receptors. I think it does have and there is a FSH RC680 uh, 
yeah. uh, gene mutation which happens on the FSH receptor and such carriers of this gene mutation require a much higher dose of FSH to have the same stimulation with the same ovarian markers. Okay. So this is one group along with that there is a LH variant also the… So does it actually affect the… When it, can, you, uh, can you make a assessment by doing the uh, tests? Yes, if it is done pre see if you find a patient with good ovarian reserve but poor response on conventional IVF, then the thing comes up that why did she respond so poorly, age is okay, reserve tests are okay. In that case, a lot of patients have been subjected to FSH polymorphism, the study of this gene mutation and if it is there, then we know that these patients will require a much higher dose and the conventional 225 dose may not work for them. Any comments on this? Okay, fine. Now, basically you say that diminished ovarian reserve is seen in about 24% uh, of infertile women and about 18% uh, of IVF cycles will show poor response and you need to uh, improve fertility and making these patients conceive. It's a big challenge for, uh, for people who are doing IVF. Now, so basically we've also said when you will do it, it's not being done as a routine. Some people will do it as a routine. As a routine. And when you're expecting a problem and polycystic ovary, uh, you're saying that it should be done, but I am not, uh, I am not always doing it on a routine basis, but generally when you're doing it for IVF, you do it because it helps you to decide on the dosage that you want to start with. Because if it's a very high level, suppose it's something like 18 or something like that, then you will always start with a much lower level first. So basically it helps you in deciding on treatment options. So this is something which is important. Now, when you come to the how you do it, now that's actually been already discussed by uh, the previous two uh, persons who have actually presented regarding AMH and uh, AFC. So basically, uh, i just like a few comments from you regarding each of these situations. Would you like to comment on, say, and that, that one more thing is when you make a statistical analysis, right, you look at the two things that you look at is basically you look at whether it is a sensitivity or a specificity and post positive predictive or negative predictive. Now what uh, the articles do say is that if it is a sensitivity, it means that there is a diminished ovarian reserve. If it is a specificity which is on the higher side, then it means that the ovarian reserve is not, the diminished ovarian reserve is not there. So this is something which is actually, this particular topic was is actually published in uh, fertility sterility in 2015. So that actually mentions this as one of the important things to evaluate as to which is the best uh, ways of handling or which are the best uh, methods of evaluating ovarian reserve. And that I will mention at the, at the end as to what is their report on that. Now, FSH controversies, would you like to comment on that? You said that you do FSH on a regular basis. Would you like to comment right. on that? <clears throat> no, I, I would only... Um, do one everything maybe at the beginning of the year and that helps me with my formula to just work out what, what's the dosage but but uh, I, I would follow uh, there are a few rules that I follow I mean maximum stimulation will be about 200 percent trying to produce a level about 200 percent of the the, the uh, basal everything however um, one should also not go beyond say 22 because according to Pro Professor uh, <clears throat> Robert from Canada, and um, about 22 FSH is probably not going to be, be uh, cost effective or useful. So one would probably aim to stimulate a, a certain percent, and, and I think mild ovarian stimulation would be about 100, 120% of her her uh, basal FSH. That's the, the uh, value I arrived at when, they, when Serrano was trying to come up with this calculator. And I, I worked with the calculator for a while. And, and then I think mild stimulation is about 100%. Any comments on Well, when AMH was not so prevalent, this was routine to do a basal FSH and estradiol. And for me, that still holds a lot of importance because on the start of IVF cycle, we always do our FSH, LH, estradiol and progesterone. And today also, if I see a high E2 with a normal FSH, a bell rings here that this is showing ovarian insufficiency because this probably intends at telling us that there is a luteal 
or a early selection of follicles which has happened in the luteal phase of the previous cycle and there would be a dyssynchrony between follicular growth and rise in E2 levels. So high E2 levels with normal FSH is a very early indication of ovarian insufficiency. Later on E2 drops, FSH rises. That becomes a true indicator of ovarian insufficiency and today in the world of AMH, even a FSH of 12, 14 or 16 which earlier we used to consider as um, very important prognostic markers for poor ovarian reserve have are losing their importance. I mean, we even stimulate in IVF patients who have FSH of 14, 15 and 16, which we used to re refuse in the earlier days, in the earlier 2000. You said that you do it on a routine basis for everybody. Am I, oh, right? I do it. No, not, uh, sorry. You said for everybody you do an FSH. Is that correct? Um, that is the normal practice, yes. Um, Any particular reason the, for doing it? In the UK, as I said, that anyone who has an FSH more than 12 cannot get NHS, so a free IVF cycle. And that is the cutoff that has been set by the government. It's the, our regulating um, Department of Health body. Um, I, do, I feel very strongly about it because you may have somebody who is young and has a high FSH and we all know that they actually have a much better outcome than a woman who would be older and have that same level of FSH. Um, it also brings into some ethical issues such as private, pr private practices that use FSH to choose their right women to get the uh, top on the league tables. And these ethical issues also creep up within these FSH controversies. Would you like to comment uh, on that? FSH combined with age, uh, it is very important. I agree with her, a younger girl with a high FSH, one would uh, go ahead and you would then even see the AMH. And th these girls, even with 14, 16, may, may, they will become pregnant because the quality of oocytes in these girls is good in spite of a high FSH. So only uh, FSH, uh, you can't, I, I, I know they have a problem, but they should not be taking off the gulls more than but then 12. Even FSH of 12, they are refusing. Yes. But that is 12 is really, the, it's a lot, the borderline stage. It's now. a gray zone. So what would you take as high and what would you take as borderline? Well, uh, a baseline FSH, if it is more than, nowadays, people are not doing baseline hormones. I'm still continuing to do my old practice since last 30 years, that I like to do a basal FSH. Though if it is over 14 or 15, we prognosticate the patient accordingly that you may have a very, very poor reserve. And now we have other uh, things also like AMH, AFC, everything put together, this FSH becomes even more important. Uh, FSH of 14 with a AFC of five or six and with an AMH of less than say 0.6 or 0.7 nanograms will indicate that this FSH is truly high and is indicating a poor ovarian response also. Okay, one more comment was, uh, is there any risk of aneuploidy if the F FSH is elevated? Do you feel anything of that is there or not? This is again, it goes hand in hand with uh, poor ovarian reserve. Like we know that at the reproductive end, the aneuploidy increases with age. We do not know whether this is true for younger girls who reach a reproductive end at 30 years of age. At 30, who has the same ovarian reserve which 40-year-old women would have, aneuploidy rate in that 40-year-old will be much higher than what it will be in the 30-year-old woman with the same reserve test and ovarian reserve. Fluctuating FSH, any comments on that? I would see the higher value and I would see the higher value uh, no. and take it. Do, do, you think, do you think that, see what happens is, uh, like the question here is better to do IVF when FSH is low in that particular cycle as compared to when a previous cycle when FSH is a little higher side. Do you think that is correct or do you think that is wrong? I, I think you have to correlate with actually the ovarian findings. I mean if you have one follicle coming into dominance, you will t definitely have a low issue. So, so would um, luteal phase folliculogenesis, even if you do the day 2 FSH, there may be already a follicle going into dominance and, and your FSH may not be up. So just your day 2 FSH is not good enough, one would have to correlate with the ovarian finding.
Is Dr. Comment? Sonal Pan Panchal here? I'm making a comment in view of her lecture that she said the lowest AFC is the correct AFC. I've heard a lot of people saying that you do every time, every cycle you do a AFC and if you find in this cycle AFC is better, stimulate that cycle. The same thing probably goes with the FSH also. But then eventually the result is almost the same. You would hardly recover maybe no, a the little the question, higher the percentage the question, the question of the question Sometimes when you do the FSH, you find it's on the higher side, comes yeah. at say 18. But then one week, two, uh, two months later you do it, it comes back at say 12. Same happens do with AFC also. Yeah. Do, you, do you think that it is better to do it on the <laughs> when it is on the lower <laughs> I side? I really don't know. Or does it have any benefit? Because some people do say that's the way to do it. This is, this is a saying which goes that look at the AFC, if it is good, stimulate the woman. But I really have very little belief in this because I have done it and it doesn't work. So what the evidence basis says it's not of very much benefit. Would you like to comment on that? I, I don't think if you should be looking at the lower value and thinking it's going to the work. Highest the highest value is what I would consider. If it is 18, that means she's going to be a very poor responder. Irrespective of the another cycle, the value may come low. And this has already been commented on, saying that you need to do the estradiol value also, especially when you're expecting uh, uh, poor ovarian reserve response. and you find that the FSH value is normal, then you always check the estradiol value to see whether it's on the higher side. Now, and uh, basically the, when the FSH is normal, so that's one thing. Now, AMH has already been discussed and mentioned upon. We'll just look at other factors. Uh, basically, uh, I just wanted to ask you about the assessment method. Now, two ways is, see, most of us are talking about nanograms, but ABBA is talking about picomoles. Would you like to mention, say anything, how that is done and what it is? To understand what you mean? Yeah, yes. see, AMH values are uh, mostly, you see, in our country are in nanograms per ml. But then we have to understand that a lot of results are reported in picomoles per liter. We do it also from our own lab. And w seven picomoles is equivalent to one nanogram. So if it is in picomoles, then we take any value less than 10 picomoles as probably a questionable responder, same as it is with 1.2 nanograms. Any comments? Um, we use the Alexis, uh, the second Alexis. generation in the UK, and um, the levels that are supposed to be good are anything over 20 to 60 what? picomoles. Picomoles so is the unit we use. Moles. Yes, that's the standard picomoles. So what per would liter. you consider as normal for an ovarian reserve, and what would you consider as low in both the two, two different ways? One is with the nanograms, and one is with the uh, picomoles. Well, I don't have much experience with nanograms, but I believe anything less than two is um, supposed to be low um, reserve. Less, um, than, less than one, generally they say. Okay. Any, um, would you like to comment? Less than one is a poor uh, ovarian reserve and more than two, between two and uh, say four, would be a satisfactory response. And from the picomoles point? See, in our own study, we had two picomoles to ten as the intermediate zone, the grey zone, where we had to counsel patients about poor response, explaining that you have a high chance of poor response, but we never refused any patient for IVF. Below two, co two picomoles, we have the right to refuse them on the basis of our own work where we thought that out of 100, only three patients responded, 97 did not. It's very high if we use two picomoles as the cutoff for taking patients for IVF. So, and you also feel that it's a fully automated method now? Yes. You see, there are two, Roche and beckman coulter yeah. Now, a lot of people have gone on to Roche from beckman coulter but then beckman coulter has also brought its next generation, which is also a very quick test, very sensitive test, and the inter-test variability is almost just about less than 8%. <coughs> so, let's see which one works better in future. Okay. Any advantages you feel with AMH? Any advantages? With AMH? Uh, I've, I've whichever method, I've yeah, there. we've already discussed that, no? Yeah, anything else you'd like to mention about that? You think it's reliable and uh, it's an early indicator and… Uh, we have to be very careful about the laboratories because no laboratory is refusing AMH at the moment. Whatever equipment they have, <coughs> whatever testing they have in India at least, nobody refuses because it is a costly test, so-called, out of all the hormones. Hence, we have to be very careful who's reporting it and how are they reporting it. 
One shouldn't use the test to deny women for Pardon? treatment. One shouldn't use the test to deny women, you know, uh, of treatment. Um, it's important to remember it's early days with AMH. We still don't have very robust uh, evidence to suggest, um, you know, what it's going to be. I and mean, that's exactly what Dr. Agrawal uh, spoke about. So um, I, it's my uh, opinion that perhaps we shouldn't be using this to predict a young girl's um, plan to have a pregnancy maybe 10 years later because they want to uh, delay uh, fertility. So as clinicians, we really have to be uh, quite wary and uh, careful in how, what message we give to our women. And you want to say? Okay. Yeah, it is going to predict your ovarian <laughs> reserve, not your but, chances oh no, of becoming pregnant. So it is not going important. to, uh, AMH doesn't predict the chances of pregnancy. You can still become pregnant, you are a young girl with low AMH also. So basically it doesn't say anything about quality of the egg also. So that's something which is important. Now, controversies with AMH, uh, basically regarding to egg quality, then uh, prediction, and then of course laboratory uh, <coughs> proficiency. And uh, basically they say that uh, the levels will be, if it is less than uh, 2 to, two to 3.5 is what they say, is a nanograms is considered as normal, anything less than 1 is considered as not good, anything more than that you have the risk of what's called OHSS and that sort of thing. So this is basically the controversy with this. Now, women, I just wanted to ask you, the, when there's a differentiation between the FSH and the AMH levels, how would you handle it and what would you think is more important or which is better, the AMH or the FSH? So, women with an elevated FSH but with a normal AMH, how would you handle it and what do you think? They do get pregnant. This is all I can tell you that some women very surprisingly with high FSH suddenly come back to you when you've already given them the prediction that, oh, you can't get pregnant with this, they come back pregnant. And the other way around? Any um, comment? Yeah, they don't even get pregnant <laughs> that no, way also. No, suppose, the, suppose FSH. FSH is normal and the AMH is abnormal. FSH is normal and AMH is very low. low yeah. That's a better predictor of pregnancy. I think a low AMH can be discarded. A lot of my young residents come back to me and they say, you know, I got my AMH and it's only 0.9 nanograms. Do I have reasons to worry? And all you need to tell them is that you've never even tried for a pregnancy. Just don't delay much, but don't go uh, press so a panic button at least. So th there are some articles which say that especially in the older women, if your FSH is on the lowest, uh, is on the normal side and the AMH is on the lower side, it may be of benefit. So that is something which has been mentioned yes. with the controversy between AMH and FSH. Well, so I, I think the FSH does depend on the feedback, and if the the a, in the AMH it's not. So if you uh, if your very small intra follicles are not producing enough estrogen to produce that feedback, you may still have a high FSH, and yet your AMH may be reasonable. Okay. Yeah. So Can you? Would you make any comment on this? Hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism and what do you think of the AMH value here? Yeah, this is in my talk which is going to come next. That this is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism has a very variable AMH level. You can have it as low as less than 1 picomoles to as high as 3 nanograms. Change the unit, 3 nanogram is a huge number when we talk in picomoles. So this there is a lot of controversy because we know the small antral follicles may not be gonadotropin dependent, yet most of the studies say that they are gonadotropin dependent or probably slightly sensitive to gonadotropin to produce AMH. So these women take a very long time to stimulate these hypo-hypo with very low AMH and maybe estrogen priming might help. I put this question on my infertility professionals no, for the, someone the to answer. Here is, uh, when the follicles are there, but the AMH is low, but why is it low when it is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism? Yeah, because AMH because is low because, because these because primordial ovaries, follicles… Ovaries, ovaries have got follicles. Yeah, these primordial follicles have never been exposed to any, any FSH at all. And whatever we say that these follicles are not FSH sensitive, they are still FSH dependent. And because of that dependency, little amount of FSH is required for these follicles to grow into the early, uh, to the preantral and the early antral stage where they start producing AMH. So, that's so that is the reason why so they have very AMH low AMH. AMH can be low in patients who have this sort of a problem. And, but it doesn't mean that it is a poor ovarian reserve. Yes. And actually when you stimulate, it'll, the AMH goes up. 
and that will tell you that there's, a, there's, no, there's no actual, uh, the ovaries are actually functioning properly. Now, AFC, ovarian volume, and um, that's already been spoken upon. Uh, anything you would like to comment on this or? Uh? Yeah, yeah, that I think is clear. Antral follicle count is a very, very sensitive thing and it should be done and we can do it ourselves. And we don't, are not dependent on anybody else. We see it with our own eyes. Do you think there's inter-observer variation problems with that? Either one person does it and you only do it then every time. There could be a variant, but if you're doing it yourself and you're doing it yours, it, that visual impression is probably the best because AMH okay, is… Can I ask you, see, sometimes there's, you have these corpus luteums or you have these cysts, endometriosis and that sort of thing. At that time, it's very difficult to actually see the exactly. AFC count. So then, are you still able to handle those sort of situations, looking only at AFC? No, then you need something else along with the, the AFC. Then you would need some other marker along with antral follicle count because that's the thing that you're doing it as a basal thing and then you suddenly on ultrasound you see the cyst or you see um, a corpus luteum cyst or a small endometriotic cyst or something else then you definitely need some other biochemical marker along with the antral follicle count to predict the ovarian so reserve. So you never go by that single thing alone, no? Yeah, it if, can, if it, it can be difficult It sometimes. can be difficult. Sometimes we see, see uh, fair-sized ovaries without really uh, entrophollicles because th those may be just stromal tissues that are left behind and the cock disease have already burned out. And also ovarian volume, any comment on that? Ovarian volume, um, seemingly fair sized ovaries but with, with very few uh, entrophollicles left. Any comment on ovarian volume? I think it goes hand in hand with what reserve ovary has. And uh, okay, so we'll just go on to the next one. Inhibin B, do any of you do actually use it or? We don't. No, nobody uses it. It's not. not something which was done earlier but not, not done any longer. This one, do you think it's of any importance? We used to do it in the past, not of now. Stopped? We stopped doing yeah. it. So basically, no longer done. So basically you're saying that AMH, AFC uh, and FSH and then of course estradiol if required at some point but these two things are not of very much benefit it is written there but it's not of very much benefit now ideally uh, do you do it for uh, once or twice do you repeat the in, uh, investigations again or do you go it only by one no i only like to repeat uh, afc again if i am in doubt that who has done the afc but amh if you think it's come from a reliable laboratory we don't repeat again not before two years Okay. Excuse Can me, I sir. Ask you? There is only two minutes yeah, left. Fine. We'll wind up soon. Sure. Any? Would you do uh, treatment for them? Poor yes, 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 yes. <laughs> well, well, I'm not really a strong believer, and in fact, Salim Dyer had actually done a meta-analysis, and he, he uh, his findings were DHEA alone uh, didn't help. <laughs> Would, would do any of you use it and what is your yeah. what is your imp, what is your advice on it well my advice is if nothing works and the patient is desperate to have her own oocytes and her amh is not miserably low i would give her option of using dhea for 12 weeks to 15 weeks before i take up for another cycle of ivf can i ask the next question androgen gel do you do you any comments on it and do you think it's better than DHEA or is it equal or is it worse? Um, I do not have any experience of using androgen gel. Uh, I've used andro androgen patches. We've done a study. We published that also. That was, that really showed a benefit in that little small series of nine cases of ours. However, after that the patches were not available. Then we tried to use the gel this time when it came. But we couldn't get, we couldn't um, produce similar results with any the gel. comment on androgen gel? gel for a very few patients and I wouldn't be able Not to comment. Yeah, very, very few patients. Have you used androgen yeah. gel? Recently yeah. we've been tried, uh, tried mm. it seems to have some benefit, seems to be slightly better than DHEA. How which regime do you use it in? Pardon, we give it for 15 days. Generally. For 15 before days before you start before stimulation and tag protocol. Yeah. Okay. A growth hormone, any uh, benefits you feel in ovarian reserve, diminished yes, ovarian I, reserve? I do use growth hormone and I, I think um, a, well, at least there's a Cochrane uh, study that uh, says it works. 
um, <clears throat> I use a small dose, just one I use, uh, and I almost use it continuously with uh, uh, older patients, say over 40. Any growth hormone use? Not used, used, it, used it sometimes, but not much. Protocol. I used, used it in hypo hypo also once. The protocol you you would advise for uh, a patient I think with one a milligram, the one which you use. What is the name of that product? That's Max Serrano protocol, Zizen. Okay, because I did read in um, the uh, you know in some articles, very late articles, that they use as little as one IU. But this is not the same as Zizen which we use. Zizen is used in four units or eight units or, or even 12, twelve units. Twelve units daily or alternate day. So what we use is Sizen. Yeah. But what he's talking about is the newer molecule which has come out and which probably is used. I, I use you use Sizen also? Okay. Sizen and of course you see I think if you use less than 8 IU per day the response is linear. And if you even and if you accept the study that uh, it's linear then whatever you do with one IU you are al almost increasing the follicular content of of growth hormone in in the, the group of wo women say over 40 you are almost dropping their age down to about 30 you almost drop 10 years even if you use just one to two units okay of, of growth hormone so you don't one doesn't actually have to use a lot patients with poor ovarian reserve what protocol do you use for IVF antagonist you hey, you would you use the same protocol I, or would you use a short protocol? I, I would actually use uh, an agonist flare for very poor response patients. Short protocol. So we do an agonist flare for two days and then go on to the antagonist protocol. Com combination? Yeah, flare just for two days. Two days and then give so a combination of agonist and antagonist. Antagonist. Do you believe in mild stimulation in these situations? Um, yes, mild <laughs> In but the sense for, that not for poor response, whether you but give a high for for most patients, I think if you are gen, gen, gentle to the ovaries, they they produce better eggs. Any comments on mild? A modified natural, not a um, true mild for a poor uh, poor ovarian reserve. No, the thing is, if you give a high dose, you may get only three four. If you do a low dose, you may get only two three. So, do you feel that it's better to if do a mild three, stimulation? If you get 3-4 on a high dose, it always, it is much uh, better than getting 2-3. So, either we get one and we are happy with one, then modified natural is very good if she's in any case a, a responder who doesn't make more than 1 so, to 2. So, sides. do you use a mild stimulation at any stage for uh, poor responders? Yes, we do and natural cycle as well. Yes, and you can do a pooling, you can do a pooling of uh, cycles. So, so and do you, you do pooling do. also? Yes. And do you find any benefits of pooling? I have a comment to make. I, I some, sometimes I think this is a situation when less is more. You see, if you give a high dose, you often get one follicle coming up very quickly. So you end up just getting that one. If you give a low dose, you, it, those, the smaller follicles may be less sensitive to, to uh, FSH. And if you don't give so much, the large, the dominant one may not be growing so quickly and take off from the others. You actually give chance for the others to catch up a bit before you, you may get a larger cohort in the end. So less definitely is more. Any Excuse me, sir. Any we'll have to wind up because... Just one minute more. Anybody, has any of you have used a dual stimulation? Yeah. Dual stimulation, both in the first round and the second yeah, round. Yeah, but this is generally for oocyte cryopreservation. That I've used it only in one case. I don't know if you have more. No, well, I don't have too much experience, but I shall actually be talking on dual stimulation tomorrow. Any, any experience on dual stimulation? Because people have said that that can be of some benefit for people with poor ovarian reserve. Yeah, the You'll second stimulation produces only more you'll have, to, you'll have to freeze it and keep. Yeah. That's the only thing. So, have you tried it? You said you tried it for one. Just in one cycle where we got more oocytes in the luteal stimulation rather than in the follicular stimulation. Was it beneficial? Uh, no, we've just done it for oocyte cryopreservation. We did not do it for uh, anything else. This girl was to go through chemotherapy for breast cancer. So we gave her letrozole with gonadotropines, got her oocytes, uh, gave her two days antagonist, restarted another stimulation with the same protocol. Okay, thank you. Thank you all.